Las instituciones financieras siguen invirtiendo fuertemente en la transformación digital con el objetivo final de obtener una ventaja competitiva centrándose en tres áreas. Ofrecer mejores experiencias a los clientes, aumentar la agilidad comercial y administrar los costos. Cada una de estas áreas ofrece nuevas oportunidades para que una institución se replantee cómo diseñar, construir e implementar sistemas de tecnología de la información y aplicaciones comerciales para hacer frente a los retos del negocio del mañana. Es un honor presentar la conferencia magistral Global It Trends in the Banking Industry. Kurt Weimerser es el director de tecnología de SSC and Algorithmics y dirige la investigación y desarrollo del portafolio de soluciones de administración de riesgos financieros, regulación y rendimiento de la compañía. Ha sido previamente director en investigación cuantitativa e ingeniería financiera, jefe de soluciones en la nube y vicepresidente de soluciones de riesgos. También tiene un MBA en ingeniería financiera de MIT y una licenciatura con doble especialización en ciencias de la computación y matemáticas de Cornell University. Agradecemos a SSNC Algorithmics por hacer posible esta conferencia. We welcome Kurt to the Digital Banking and Financial Technologies Forum. Good afternoon. It's very bright up here. Today we're going to talk about some digital IT trends that banks and more broadly speaking financial institutions around the globe are focused on. They are process automation. And by that I mean using technology to replace human interactions. We're going to talk a little bit about cloud operating models. So many of you are on the journey to cloud. When I think about it, I think about it as two steps. The first step is can you take your application and re-engineer it for the cloud? That's virtual machines, that's Docker, that's Kubernetes, that's thinking about resiliency, disaster recovery. The second part, once you've got it there, is how do you operate it, right? That's the second part of the journey. So we're going to talk about some of the considerations that you need to think about when you're operating an application on the cloud. And the last topic we're going to touch on is real-time analytics. And by this I mean not only trading style real-time analytics, but any time we take a process that may take six hours and get it to run it in 10 minutes, or we take something that currently takes three months and we get it down to a couple days, right? That focus on getting it faster and faster and faster, that computational aspect is, is really important. And I'm going to focus on a risk management example that I've personally been involved in, but you can extrapolate it to other, other kinds of use cases. Now, there, there are three themes that are common to each of these technology trends and why the, that are driving these trends. So the first one is productivity, right? Increased productivity in a couple different dimensions. One dimension is employee or worker productivity. Another dimension is scale. Can we do 1,000 transactions? Can we do 10,000 transactions? Can we do 100,000 transactions? So productivity is a theme. A second theme is cost, right? You know, can we lower our costs? And sometimes those costs are measurable. You can actually see reduction in costs, and sometimes they're not as measurable. We think about them as what would it cost in the marginal sense to do that extra work? So how efficient can we scale our business, right? And so costs are sometimes very easy to measure and sometimes they're, they're less easy to measure and we think about them in the marginal sense. And the last thing, the last driver is better business outcomes, right? We're all about driving better business outcomes. So that might be doing something that we couldn't do before. It could be responding to an external event or it could be higher cu you know, customer satisfaction. So throughout my talk, I'm going to use a lot of examples, and, and we'll try and try tie them back to those three themes. Okay, so productivity, cost, better business outcomes. So process automation. There are sort of two types of process automation when we talk about that. One is 
what we call robotic process automation, RPA. And by that we mean using a bot, a robot, a digital worker, to do the action that a person would do. So logging on to a web page to get some data and pulling it down. Reading an email, taking an attachment from that email and doing something with it. Think about RPA as technology, bots, scripts that are doing or mimicking human interaction. So they're very small atomic events. They're typically rule-based. They're typically very manually intensive and they're repetitive. You do them over and over and over again. The second type of process, process automation is business process automation, BPA. And by that, I'm talking about a whole end-to-end -end complex series of steps, right? And that may be all done by robots doing different steps or digital workers doing different steps. It also may be what they call human in the loop process animation. So the, a digital worker does something, a human does something, a digital worker does the next step, a human does the following step. So taking these processes and putting and redesigning them so that you have digital workers who are contributing to it. Okay, so those are the two basic you know, definitions that we'll use. Um, there's some terminology. We talked about the first two already. Um, the other term that's often used is intelligent automation, IA. Not to be confused with AI, right? This is intelligent automation. Now, when we get to this, we will talk about IA and AI in a second, but the concept of bots, digital workers, there's unattended bots that just respond to events. They're looking for, for triggers and they just do things. You have attended bots. We talked a little bit about that where a, a person might be involved in doing something. We have hybrid bots that are, that are in, in, uh, in between. We have chat bots, which is probably the one that mo people are most familiar with, right? Where people are interacting with a, a chat bot. You know, you're typing in some service request, you're getting a response, you're doing something else. They may eventually pass you off to a human, right? But that's a very common pattern. So those are all terms for, you know, digital workers, robots, unattended bots, um, attended bots, hybrid bots, chat bots. They're all flavors of the same thing. Now, I mentioned AI because AI plays a role in this. So there are four types of AI that you typically run into when you're talking about process automation. The first one is optical character recognition, so OCR. That's taking a PDF and figuring out that the box has some numbers in it and what those numbers are, or it has some text and taking a name out of an application for a loan, for example. All right, that's OCR. Natural language processing that's the ability to understand language. So that's where the chat bot, when you type something in, they're understanding what you're saying or what you're typing. Natural language generation, that's when the chat bot responds to you, right? That's what they say something back to you. So, you know, GPT um, has been in the, in the news recently. Um, that's all about natural language generation. There's a little bit of natural language processing. I don't know how many, how many people have played with GBT, right? So you type in something at the beginning. It tries to understand what, you, what you're asking and then it generates, you know, one or 10 pages of text. You now I've used it to do text. I've tried to do it to write some code. It's, it's kind of interesting. It has some limitations outside the scope of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and the last thing is machine learning. So many of these processes you want to improve over time. So machine learning is an AI technique that you can, you can evolve the responses, evolve the behavior as well. So when you talk about process automation and you talk about bots and digital workers, these are the AI techniques that come into play. So a year ago, SSNC purchased Blue Prism. So I have a lot of very specific examples, and we'll spend the next few slides looking at what clients are actually doing. Right? So the first example is Banco Santander. This is actually from Argentina. This is during COVID. They, like other 
countries around the world had a COVID relief program where they had money available for businesses, so a loan program. They had 50,000 pre-approved candidates, $250 million to hand out, and they were concerned about being swamped by the loan applications and being able to do it. So they took two days and built a bot, a digital worker, to process loan applications. Now they're pre-approved, so they've you know, the, the hurdle's a bit lower. They're their own customers, right? Um, they were able to, in two days, build a digital worker that allowed them to process a COVID relief loan application in under three minutes. They were able to do, as you see on the slide, uh, 1,300 applications a day. And they estimate the amount of time that they saved at 57,000 hours. Now, roughly speaking, a person, a human, works about 2,000 hours in a year. That would be equivalent of about 26 FTE. So if they had to hire people and they wanted to do it in a year, it would be about 26 people. So you can see the sort of scale that we're talking about, right? And you'll see a lot of these examples are measured in FTEs. You know, this isn't savings. This is what they would have spent. This is how much the FTE equivalent of what the robot or the digital worker was doing. So that's one example. Another example from Argentina is Banco Galicia. Um, so they had a situation where they had a lot of credit card accounts. So accounts where they had clients who have credit cards, great, but a lot of them weren't active. Or not a lot, a certain percentage were not active. And they were incurring fees for those accounts that weren't active. And so the existing process was somebody would go and they'd log on to the account, they'd figure out whether it's a Visa or MasterCard, they would go to that, um, find out whether there was an outstanding balance, see when the last time the, uh, the person did a transaction, etc. cetera. Um, and they, it was a very labor-intensive process, but it was one that you could actually, again, rules, you, there's a set of rules that they could follow to go and close the accounts. And so what they did is they were, you know, created a digital worker and in the end, they found 500,000 accounts that they deemed to be inactive, right? And they were, went through and they did that process of looking at the account, figuring out whether it was Visa or MasterCard, American Express, et cetera, and looking at whether there was a balance and, and stuff and then deciding which ones they were going to close. At the end, they saved close to $3 million in fees and other expenses associated with these accounts. Now this is an example where you can actually measure quantifiably the, the savings, right? In the previous example, it was more of a customer satisfaction issue. They got the loan out. So the better business income for Banco Santander was they were able to process the loans. Here, the, the, the positive income, the better, sorry, the positive outcome is actually a savings that you can quantify. And again, using the uh, 2,000 hours for an FTE, it's about eight FTEs, okay? So not a huge amount of, in terms of people, but, you know, the savings are, are dramatic. So Schroeder's is another example. They're a bit more um, along the curve in this process. And I'm going to use three different examples of Schroeder's. And these are more buy side, global uh, wealth management, asset management type of examples. But, um, and they all start to get into now human in the loop types of processes where we have multiple steps and people engaged. So the first one is proxy voting. So you're a fund manager, you've got a lot of proxies coming in, you've got to vote, send them back to some external website. So what they did was they created a digital worker that read the emails when the proxies came in, did some OCR on the attachments, collected all that information and presented it to the fund manager who would then fill out the form what their votes were. The fund manager would send a response back to another digital worker that would then look at the response and vote, log on to the website and vote on behalf of the, of the fund manager. Okay, so they've automated a process with a human in the middle. Similar type of process was for trade confirmation. So, you know, 
Somebody does a trade during the day, broker sends an email with a, with a trade confirmation, right? And then they want to make sure that it, it matches what they have in, in Aladdin, which happens to be their trading system, right? So again, originally it's a very manual process. Person reads the attachment, looks at it, goes into Aladdin and checks to make sure it's okay. So they, again, built a digital worker to take the email from the broker, look at the trade, extract the information, build an Excel spreadsheet that could be reviewed by a person as well, and then log on to Aladdin and do the, that reconciliation and make sure that the trade confirmation matches what's in the trading system. Third example is price discovery. So. Um, they have a system where, at the end of the day, they want prices from multiple places. So Bloomberg, IDC, Six Financial are their three sources of price information. So again, they built a process where, for Bloomberg, it's a human process still. The human logs on, gets the price for a given security. But for IDC and Six, they built a digital worker to do that same thing. Take the ID, log on, get the information. They build the spreadsheet of prices and then load it into their system downstream for their nav and for everything else they need to do. So again, multiple step processes. Now we're in the BPA world. In these three cases, there's always a human as part of it. So what they're doing is they're making the process more efficient. I'm gonna finish with um, Nordea. Nordea is a, a bank um, in the Nordics. They're based in Finland. And they have embraced business process automation and RPA at a very high level. So they started out in 2015. They had two people doing this. Today they have a center of excellence with 100 people. They have over 1,600 digital workers involved in 580 business processes across eight business units. So they have gone all in on this. And, and, and their use cases range, um, you know, one of them is a no, KYC, know your customer example. So their regulator came to them and said, your current process isn't, isn't working. They were sending out information, people weren't responding, so like using the mail to send out requests for information. And, and what they did is they looked and they said, hey, we know a lot of this information already. It's just in one of our systems somewhere. Um, so they went and developed, a, again, a business process automation where they went to their existing systems to extract the information, assemble it together. A human comes in and does some verification. If there's data missing, then they reach out to the customer and then, at the end of the step, they load it into the final system. They were able to process one million accounts in eight months. And they estimate it is around 300 FTEs would have been the equivalent amount of people they would have needed to do the same thing. Similarly, um, you know, a slightly easier example to understand is credit card requests. So somebody has a name change and they want a credit card, new credit card issued with their new name. The old process was that they would call up and they would wait on the phone on average five and a half minutes before they talk to a human who would then get the information and issue the new card. They completely automated this process with a chat bot. It now essentially is zero minutes, zero time to do it. And although from an FTE perspective, it's almost zero, there's no savings here, their client satisfaction around this process is really high. So here's an example. They took a very simple process and they eliminated a pain point for their customers. And you know, I hate waiting online you know, on the phone for a human when that chat bot can or that automated voice can't answer the question that I want. But when it does, it's really good, right? And so there's an example where they took a very simple process and completely automated it. 
I'll end with one more example from Nordea. Um, so the last example from them is a suspicious activity report. So anti-money laundering application. So in the old process, they would get a series of these reports and they weren't able to handle them all. So they would sample and selectively choose a few of them, look at the transactions, put it through whatever rules had to be applied to determine whether it warranted further investigation, and go on. They decided to, to use um, you know, digital workers to bring that work in and do that first tier of analysis, apply a set of rules as to whether this needed further investigation, and then pass it off to a human if it met a certain criteria. Yes, this needs additional investigation. So again, they were looking to speed up the whole process. In the beginning, they could process about 2,000 transactions. And that's not reports, that's transactions that they actually looked at. After, that's a month, 2,000 transactions a month. Afterwards, they were able to process all of the transactions, so 187,000 approximate transactions a month that they looked at with the digital worker, and then passing on any that needed further investigation to a human. Okay, so in this one, they estimate about 200 FTEs that they saved in terms of, you know, this is what it would have taken to do the same process if they wanted to look at every single transaction. So they went from 2,000 to looking at 187,000, give or take, transactions a month. And that would have been about 200 FTEs to do that same level of work. So they're all in, and we have a short video where they're going to talk about what they've done. What does technology mean for Nordea? It is definitely one of the key aspects where we want to be the leading bank. We're very much interested in being the leading bank when it comes to omni-channel uh, for our customers so that they can choose the way they want to interact with the bank. I think that's a big one many banks have seen before is that they have a nice front end, but when it comes to the bank, it actually tends to be quite manual. So from our point of view, Clearly, one important part is that we also then automate a lot of the back-end processes. So we tried out robotics. We chose Bloopers as our platform provider. We built over 570 robots. Out of those 570, we have around 380 in production. Those bots, last year on average, brought back to business more than 1,000 FTEs. What is actually interesting about Blue Prism as a platform as well is that it enables multiple integrations, which actually makes it possible for you to, to think broader. It's not only robotics, it is enabling intelligent automation. When we look at something like robotics, we are not just buying a one-time service. It is that we build our robotics now based on Blue Prism. We need to look at this as a, as a longer-term partnership. From my point of view, it has been very good. It was very clear that Hubrism was the one we, which had the, the edge when it came to the actual technology. What is, I would say, super unique about Blue Prism, what was important for our choice, was basically that it is easy to use. It has certain frameworks which allow business people to do automation, which is kind of unique. Of course, you need training and you need to have a fund for that, but at the end of the day, uh, our robotics COE is located on the business end. We serve all business areas right now, so it does not matter if it's front, uh, middle or back end of the bank, if these are processes that are valid for the customers or if it's internal administration. There's potentials everywhere. We have used the robotics process automation quite a bit on our financial crime mitigating actions. So where we would have needed hundreds of people to do certain tasks, we've actually been able to then put robotics in there. The other thing is it has helped us with is the mindset of thinking our processes not from a way of how do we just automate a previously manual process, but how do we think of our processes from the point of view of data. So sometimes more and more we actually have human beings helping robots rather than robots helping human beings. What I think is really exciting is that we are now reaching a point 
when we're looking at how intelligent automation can influence the customer journey. And so the lens is changing. Okay, so that's topic one. Topic two, we're going to move into the cloud. And as I stated earlier, I think about the cloud and the journey to cloud as two steps. The first step is a technology step of can we re-engineer, re-architect our applications to run on the cloud. But the second step is once you're there, can you run it on the cloud? And how do you run it on the cloud? And there are three questions that um, I think are important. So the first one is can you install a new instance of your application on the cloud in under 30 minutes. And by this I mean deploy all the infrastructure, virtual machines, networking rules, storage, etc., as well as your application. Can you do it in 30 minutes? Can you stand up a new application in 30 minutes? And there's a date where this clicked for me. That date is December 10th, 2021. So what's significant on that? That's the date that the Log4j zero day security issue was announced with a CVE number and a score of 10. 10 is the highest. Okay, so it had been discovered a couple weeks before. The patch came out on the Monday. I started hearing about it on Friday morning, the 10th. By Friday evening, my CR chief risk officer is calling me saying, how are you going to patch your applications? Right? And it turned out that by some estimates, 93% of the applications around the world, including everything from iCloud to AWS, were impacted by this zero-day um, zero event. So I had two teams under me doing operations. One team could do this. They spent half an hour patching, they installed into UAT, they tested, they promoted, in two hours they were done Friday night, gone. I had another team that couldn't do this. They spent all weekend, 48 hours straight, logging on the machines, patching, changing, testing, etc. One team was done on Friday night. The other team was all, all weekend, literally all weekend. We had people around the globe working on this. All right? So it, it's, it's, from there it was like, okay, we got to do this everywhere. This is really important. And the technology is there to do it. So there's, there's some tools, and th these are fairly new tools, and they're tools in the cloud space, but they can be used to automate your deployments across the board. Now there are other tools, these are the ones that, that, that are my team uses. Um, so, so Git's a fairly common tool in the developer space, but instead of using it for source code, we use it to control all our configurations. So any file that an application needs, we store in Git. Okay? And it, it could be a configuration file, it could be a parameter file, it could be a, and we'll talk about salt states and Terraform states as well later, but anything that we are going to use to define, we store in Git. And then we use, we, we use Git, GitHub, but GitLab is equivalent. We use GitHub actions to control when we deploy. So we do what's a quote called a pull request, where we say, hey, we want to do something. It requires an approval, so if I'm a developer, I can't, I can't approve my own pull request. So GitHub Actions, and, and you could do it in, in GitLab CI CD, and there are other ways you could do it as well, but that allows us to control when something happens. Okay? Artifactory is a tool where it, which stores artifacts. That's where you put everything else you might need. So if you're installing an application and you need a special add-in, a plug-in, a module, we put our Docker images in Artifactory. That's where you store all that. Terraform is the tool that allows you to specify what your hardware infrastructure should look like. How many VMs do you need? How, much, how many cores? What's the RAM? What's the storage? It, it's, it's that definition of the environment. Salt is a tool that allows you to say what's an instance look like. So what does a VM look like? 
What tools does it need if you're in Linux space? You know, what are the modules that you need installed? What are the other packages that you need to put on that VM? And finally, you know, it can be a cloud CI, it could be Bolt, it can be Ansible. They're, they're tools that allow you to do things. This is where you actually install your application. Right, so these are all tools that are, you know, reasonably new in the sense that they have, um, you know, been developed over the last four to five years. But if you work, use them all together, you can achieve that goal of installing new applications, including all the har hardware infrastructure on the cloud. And, and the, 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 the goal I give my team is 30 minutes. You need to be able to install everything in 30 minutes. Because I don't want to be in another situation like December 10th, 2021, where I have to have a team working all weekend. Because that means I work all weekend, too, to make sure things are going. Um, so, so that's a really important part of cloud operations, right? And it, it's, it's one that most people don't think about until they've actually started to run on the cloud. The second one is, you know, question that you need to ask is, is my application available and working? So I've got it on the cloud. I've installed it in 30 minutes. It's been running for the last three days, but is it working right now? If a client tries to access my application, is it gonna work as expected? So what's the number one, what do you think the number one failure out there is? It's running out of disk space. That's the most common mistake that people make, right? There's some process that's logging data and, and we forget to clean it up, right? So it just, the, the machine runs out of disk space and everything crashes, right? And so that's called an infrastructure check. So infrastructure checks are checking, is my hardware okay? You know, do I have enough disk space? Is my C CPU utilization what I expect? And you need to be running those all the time. The second kind of check is a synthetic check. This is mimicking client behavior. This is when a client logs on to my application, are they gonna be A, able to log on, and can they do some job? So what we do in our cloud business is every 10 minutes we run a series of synthetics that mimic clients doing something. Just a small workload, but something, right? And it stresses the whole system. Like it has to work end to end, right? Not only do you log on, you have to do something, right? And so, you run these checks and then you have to have the alerting in place, right? You have to be able to notify people when things aren't working, either the infrastructure case, I ran out of disk space, or my application isn't working, right? And so it's really important that you have a process in place. And again, there are lots of tools that can do this, um, that people are actually then watching those. So if there were a cloud issue with my application, my phone, which is sitting right here on the table, would start buzzing, right? Because I get notified every time there, there are outages, right? But you, we have people around the globe who are, who are doing this, who are watching, right? And then lastly, you need to take all those log files because, you know, once you get to a, a support issue, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to look at log files, right? And so you want to bring all those log files together into one place so that you can look at the timestamps. And we do a little trick as we put a transaction ID because we're in a, a, a microservices environment with lots of different services and we put a transaction ID. So when a client comes in and makes a request, that transaction ID gets passed along as it goes from microservice to microservice. So we can go in the log files and look at that transaction ID and follow, follow it through, right? So that's another really important thing because if your log files are all distributed, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. So the last question that you want to ask is, is my environment secure. So I get lots of these questions from clients today, you know, is your environment secure? So there are two, at least in the world of finance, big regulations that we adhere to. One is SOC 1 and the other is SOC 2. So SOC 1 involves anything involving financial statements. So if you have a process that is going to impact financial statements, so accounting, you need to be SOC 1 compliant. SOC 2 compliant is client data. Can you protect your client data? And the way both of these work is that 
you first have to design the controls. So they, they, they list a series of things you need to do. You have to design the controls. And by controls, I mean, what is your policy around these different topics? And you first get approval on those controls. That's called a, a, a type one report, that you have controls, you've designed controls, and an auditor has said, yes, your controls are satisfactory. Then what you do is you implement the controls, and there's a six-month collection period. So for six months, you have to collect data. And at the end of that, the auditors come in and they check and see, are you actually following the controls that you put in place. So if you have a password policy that says passwords need to be, you know, 12 characters long and have an integer in it and, and such, and they need to be changed every six months, they will actually verify that, that you're following those rules. And at the end of those audit periods, you get what's called a SOC 2 report, which says that you're in compliance, and then you can hand those out to clients or anybody else who's interested and say, yes, I meet those re requirements. So from an, uh, oh, oh, so just to pause, there are two things involved here. There's the hardware and the cloud side of the SOC world, and then there's the application side. So the cloud providers take care of the controls around the hardware and, the, and that aspect. So does the data center have a lock on the door? Who's allowed in the data center? Right? Who can make changes to the physical infrastructure? That's handled by the cloud providers. And if you go on their websites, and I've got some pages, all the big guys have SOC 2 compliance right, around their infrastructure. But the second step is that you need to put application controls around this. And I've highlighted a few in blue. We won't talk about all of them. But these are ones that are actually, they're, they're pretty much common sense. But they're hard to implement in many places, and I know I struggled with, it with, it with my team because they're culturally different from the way people are typically used to work. So one of the big ones is, um, you know, unique IDs. So what that says is everybody has to have their own username and password. You can't have a shared username and password. Well. In my development organization, at least in test environments, it happens all the time, right? They install something, the username is A, and the password is 123, and that's what they use to test, right? So that's the, that's the mindset that they're in, and if you're not careful, they do that in production. All the services guys will have the same password for logging in to debug an issue, right? So you just, you gotta say, no, you can't do that. Another big one is the segregation or separation between production and development. So you have to have systems that are completely isolated, right? You can't have a production system that has a network connectivity to a dev system or vice versa, right? So you gotta look at all the network access and make sure that you're completely separate, right? And again, it, it's something that the developers don't think that way. They think about, oh, if I wanna fix something, I wanna make sure that I have that connectivity so I can get in there and, and do it. And it's like, no, you can't do that because the minute you do that, you have no controls over where the data goes. A client data can go from a production system, get sucked over to a dev system, right, and then go beyond that. Um, the last one that I'll talk about is, is change management. You have to have a process of approvals over when things get applied to production, right? Again, culturally, at least in my organization, it's a really tough one because the developers just want to fix something and do it. Right, but you need to have a process in place that looks at it. Somebody is actually evaluating how big is this change, what's the potential impact, and more importantly, if it doesn't work, how do we undo it? Right, and there's a lot of, of, of work that goes into cloud operations of how do you undo something, right? And so that's a really big thing. Okay, so we're gonna move on to real-time analytics. So this is uh, the last topic we're gonna talk about I'm going to use as this example a, a project that I've been working on um, around risk management. But, but why, why, why is this important? Why are people focusing on it across the board? Well, the first one is just being able to you know, respond to market events, right? The second one is that senior management asks lots of really hard questions. And the faster you can answer them, the better off you are. Right, and you know, I was working a few years ago with uh, ING Insurance, they're now NN Insurance, and they had a process to calculate their capital that took three months. And we worked 
with them to shrink that to three days. And for them, that was real time. Going from you know, three months to three days was real time. And the chief risk officer and I were chatting, and he, he said, Kurt, you know, now that the board knows that I can do this in three days, you should see all the questions they're asking. You know, what if this were to happen? What if that were to happen? Because they can get responses and actually do something about it. So, you know, that's a really common pattern that once you start to speed up your applications, senior management wants you to do more, right? They want to be able to run the business. They want to do those what if scenarios. Um, it's, a, it's important. Um, and that's where the operational model that comes in. You know, the faster you can do it, the faster you can respond to those. In my world, in risk management, data errors happen all the time. If your calculation takes 10 hours, you can fix it tomorrow. Right? That's not a very good answer, but that's the answer. That's the world I live in. Or you have really complex processes in place that you implement to just rerun that small piece of work and amend the results and update the report. It's really complicated. It's error prone. Right? But if I can run it in 10 minutes, just rerun the whole thing, fix the error, rerun it. And last thing, if I can run it this fast, if, you know, if, I, if I can really improve the performance, then, then I can reduce hardware costs. Right? I can utilize that hardware maybe on other jobs. I can run, in my world, running more simulations is really important in risk management, so I can run more simulations for the same cost. So my example is going to be around simulating credit risk. So we won't go into the math at all, but, but the thing you want to take away is to do credit risk, whoops, you need to do a simulation. You need to run a Monte Carlo simulation. Usually 2,000, maybe more simulations. And it's credit risk, so it has a fairly long time horizon. Right? So you're doing lots of time steps because your exposure can change dramatically, and you're going to do that out. And when you're done that, you're going to calculate your exposures. You know, your potential future exposures, your mean exposures, et cetera. So the point of this is to do counterparty credit risk, you run a big simulation. It's expensive. If you want to do CVA, credit value adjustment, right, you got to do something more. But the key thing is that there's this EE term in the middle. That's your expected exposure. So to do a CVA, Right? And CVA is the difference between the risky asset and the non-risky asset. Another way to think about it is what's the cost of hedging out the credit risk of an OTC derivative. Right? But the point is to do CVA, you need to do the same exposure calculation. Right? And then if you get on to XVA, well, there's CVA, there's DVA, FVA, KVA, CallVA, MVA. There's all these different you know, value adjustments that you could make to the price of your derivative. And when you want to do sensitivities on these, and by the way, each one of those requires that same simulation. And then if you want to do sensitivity, see how any of these change because of a change in a risk factor, you got to do it again. And so, if you think about calculus and the definition of derivative, it's the limit as, x, as delta x goes to zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. Or, sorry, you know, basically, it's, it's that, you know, how much does my function change over that shrinking window, right? So for many of these calculations, what people do is they do it analytically, right? They calculate the sensitivity, the derivative, by doing two calculations. They do the base case, and they change one of those risk factors by a very small amount, and they do it again. Right? And they repeat that across lots of different risk factors. It becomes very, very expensive. So about four years ago, we said, hey, we need to think about this differently. We need to think about how do we approach this in a completely different way. Right? Because the, the, the way we'd always been doing it wasn't working. So we're going to look at a short video, and then we'll come back and talk about some customer outcomes and then how we did it. Imagine if your risk calculations were hundreds of times faster. You could run multiple enterprise-wide financial risk calculations every day with fresh data. Introducing the SSNC Algorithmics Hyper Risk Engine. This groundbreaking high-performance risk engine enables you to significantly increase your simulations, 
Recompute hundreds of sensitivities in real time. Rehedge quickly in times of market stress and shrink your hardware to a fraction of your current footprint. The Hyper Risk Engine is truly game changing innovation. It gives you the power, flexibility, and agility to accelerate performance and change your risk business in ways you could only imagine before. Contact us today to see SSNC Algorithmics Hyper Risk Engine in action. So we've got a couple examples of clients. So the first one is a counterparty credit risk. So that very first example I showed you. So the existing process they ran on uh, 48 cores. They had 46,000 trades, 2,000 scenarios, 156 time steps. It took them an hour to do. After we rethought the problem, we could do it in 36 cores in 10 seconds, same calculation. All right, that's a 300 times performance improvement. Another uh, counterparty credit risk. This one, we, we kept the cores the same. All right, so we took, this, this time it's 140,000 trades, 2,000 scenarios, 100 time steps. We took a job that takes, took eight and a half hours down to two minutes. Okay, so 250 times performance gain. And the last one is, this is an XVA sensitivity. So that's that last slide that I showed where you have the FVA and the DVA and the KVA. Um, this is a, a client that was running 4,000 cores, right? It's 100,000 trades, it's 2,000 scenarios, it's 156 time steps, so it's a big problem. They were doing 20 sensitivities, so 20 of those numerical, I'm gonna bump a risk factor a little bit and rerun. It, they did it in six hours. That's how they, they took them 4,000 cores to run it overnight. So after we re-ran it, it's 120 cores in 10 minutes, so it's like a thousand times faster. So you're saying, like, how in the world could you get that kind of performance boost? Like, what could you possibly do? Right? So we just rethought the problem, and we took advantage of things that are available today, technology that's out of the box, it's out there, but we just rethought the problem. So we did a handful of things. So first of all, I started my career working on VAX Fortran compilers. I worked for Digital Equipment Corporation, and we were working on supercomputers. So digital at the time was trying to compete with Cray. So the big thing was vector CPU. So a vector CPU allows you to take arrays and manipulate them in chunks of 64. So you can add two arrays really quickly. So if you can get your problem into arrays, you can take advantage of vector operations. Now everybody has a laptop. Since about 2008, your laptop has had vector instructions on it that are as powerful as the supercomputers of Cray of the 80s and 90s. Right? We don't use it because you don't need it for word processing. You don't need it for Excel, right? But it's there. So that means that every AWS EC2 instance, every Azure VM, every Google VM has vector capabilities. It's there. So if you can take your problem and rework it to use that vectorization, you can get a huge speed up. So that's the first thing we did. We took advantage of hardware that's out there, it's available, but people don't use. And we looked at that, hey, you know, we, we run lots of scenarios, Etc. We reformulated the problem into these vectors, and we got a huge performance boost. The other thing is we. The next thing is we took advantage of this technology called LLVM. It's basically a backend that allow you to target different types of architecture. So we didn't want to know in advance whether you're running on a Mac or an IBM, or you, whether your the server has a GPU or not, right? So we said let's use LLVM as our target. We built the model to use that, and then that figures out and takes advantage of whatever hardware is available. The next thing we did is we looked at it mathematically. So a joint differentiation, the concept here is, you know, differential calculus. So you can basically use the chain rule and calculate partials to do sensitivities. The other way you can think about it is from a computer science perspective, when you calculate something, you can take the little different pieces and reassemble them 
right, and save time. And lastly, we did some smart scheduling, right? So we have this algorithm where we, we figure out that, you know, big counterparties, large, large counterparties are more expensive than others. We should schedule them first. And then as we run the problem, rebalance the workload across the available hardware. If new worker nodes come in, we are able to take advantage of them. At the end of the day, this wasn't about inventing something new. It was about using the technology that was available, rethinking the problem from a hardware perspective, from a mathematical perspective, and saying, how can we run this faster? And we got some pretty impressive results. And, and the basic thinking can be applied to any business problem. Right? Again, this is a risk management example, but it could be applied to any business problem. So with that, I think we're going to turn it over to some Q&A.